Welcome to the Odd Frog Chop Shop, your one-stop podcast for all things toy, design, collectible, comic book, video game, movies, pop culture, and more. And now, please welcome your hosts, Kelly Greenwood and Eddie Eremosio. Welcome back to the show. We're doing something a little bit different today. We're uh, branching off from the Chop Shop, which we'll also still be doing. But uh, we have an interview today with a very special guest, and we're uh, bringing in the Killa Kawaii crew. We've got uh, Killa Kawaii crew, we've got Johnny Toxin, and uh, our teams are kind of joining um, for this entertainment kind of uh, stuff we're doing. And um, we want to do kind of um, share our first interview with you guys. And I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of updates on the Bandito real quick. Um, Eddie and I have a very important meeting coming up uh, January 9th on Tuesday. So a lot could, uh, could happen there. Don't Very exciting. Get, thank you. Can't get into it too much. And then right after that, we're going to be hopefully sending the Bandito on a tour of influencers in the 112 world that are very serious collectors. And um, we're hoping we can... Um, you know, show them what we've done with the Bandito and the level of quality that we're trying to bring. And uh, so with that out of the way, um, I'd like to introduce everybody who's part of the Killa Kauai crew and our special guest. First of all, real quick, I'm Kelly, uh, Odd Frog Entertainment. This here is my best friend and business partner, Eddie Hermosillo. Eddie, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Absolutely, yeah. And like you said, my name's Eddie. We met years ago back in community college, became best friends. Uh, went to art school, decided to start our own business, our own company after graduating with toy design degrees. And uh, yeah, I'm the COO, he's the CEO. And uh, like he mentioned, uh, the Chop Shop right here is our first brand. A little bit of news on that. Like he mentioned, we do have a big meeting coming up with General Giant Studios. Uh, we're touring the studios. We're talking about how, how we can make things happen together. Just just preliminary talks and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. So. That's, that's what's going on on our end, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take it off back. Go ahead, Kelly. All right, and then, as I said, we've got the Killa Kauai crew. Guys, and if you aren't familiar with the Killa Kauai crew and Johnny Toxin, go on to Instagram. There'll be links in this below when we, when we uh, post it, and um, check them out. Super into toys, super knowledgeable about designer toys, which we're all very interested in over here right now, and that's about all I'll say about that. But uh, Gabriella, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll go to Johnny and then our guest. What's up guys, Kill a Kawaii crew. Uh, most people on Instagram, they all know me. I'm trying to get into the YouTube universe. Thanks to Kelly, he's been really helping me out with that. And of course, my lovely partner is Johnny Toxin. We call our stuff Sass Theater and Sass Theater is now combining with Odd Frog Entertainment. And we're doing a duo of these two universes, the 112 scene and designer toys. And of course, now we have our lovely guest here, Daniel Cunningham, who's a huge Gundam builder and an artist and a collector who's the perfect kind of person who totally is the collector that we want to talk to. And then Johnny, of course, introduce yourself as well. Johnny's just, you know, hustling over there. Yeah, I'm just on the move tonight. Yeah, I'm just a uh, friend of the family, right? That's what I am. Friend of the <laughs> who, uh, I don't just uh, collect has uh, interesting insights, loves to uh, loves to just see awesome things. And good Lord, there's a lot of awesome things anymore. Oh man, Johnny collects so much stuff, guys. Like, I mean, Hearthstone, 100% dumpster. It's uh, the bear, uh, uh, I, it's, uh, I can't even think of all the names. Mysterio, like it's so many artists. So it's like, he's a huge oh, yeah. collector. And Kelly's helping us make our toys right now. Like Kelly's really been taking me under his wing. So there's a lot of cool stuff coming with our companies joining together. So well, now that we got all the fun is. stuff. It's not only yeah. me, but yeah. Yeah, Odd Frog. Sorry, sorry, Odd Frog. I mean, you too, Eddie. But now that we've got all these introductions done, let's get into the interview. So, Daniel, you just won some really cool competitions in San Diego. You're located in California, and mm -hmm. you're super into Gundams. You've been collecting them for forever and more. So, let's talk about why do you like Gundams? What's like your purpose to keep that uh, keep that consistency with your collection? All right. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me on. It's a real honor for me to have my first interview ever with such an awesome group, both Odd Frog and Killa Kawaii crew. Thank you. But um, yeah, so I've been building and collecting uh, Gundam since around 2016. 
And for me, it's just been something that's always cool. I always loved sci-fi stuff, like a lot of Star Wars stuff. I used to, you know, you know, I was a Lego kid. I grew up right when they really started taking off from early 2000s onwards. Even now, I still keep up with the news. But for me, Gundam just really stuck with me. The first kit I ever built, you know, I, I just loved working with my hands. I'm like, this is really awesome. And then just start evolving my hobby from there to where it became more of an art form through customizing, painting, but still keeping the collecting part alive, certainly. Absolutely. Like, it's it's really amazing what you've done. I mean, do you have that build that you won with, that really cool uh, motorcycle Gundam build that you have? Yeah, so I have a couple. So the motorcycle one was just uh, one I did for fun uh, right here. I can show you. It's a Yamaha R1M. But then I That's customized cool. it up to look a little bit kind of like more of a Gundam theme with the Zaku, one of the enemy mobile suits, both in color and some of the insignia. But while still keeping a lot of the realistic details that most motorcycles have, and being a motorcycle rider myself, it really struck home for me, just like, oh, I got to do this. Oh man, I was really excited when I saw this because like everyone here, like I know all their tastes in toys, obviously what Eddie and what Kelly do, and Johnny's a big Gundam fan. Uh, they're nice. designers for Gundam, like Quick, he's a big advocate, he's super inspired by Gundam, so Gundam theme, super big in the design of toy world. But guys, uh, let's start with Eddie. Eddie, what do you think about that motorcycle build? No, I, I definitely think you nailed it. I think being able to nail the, the, the paint scheme and just certain certain lines that you have to nail to make it look like mm -hmm. I'm, I was just working on one myself, you know, certain angles and certain lines definitely nice. speak Gundam to you, you know what I'm saying? So having mm -hmm. a custom paint job on certain things definitely makes it, makes it unique in your own. That's definitely kind of what the market we're going towards with 112 scale and making things customizable and things like that. But I mean, like, like she was saying, um, we did see that you saw you uh you won you did one those awards and I just think that the aspect that you you're able to like almost apply a story to things, you know what I'm saying? Like I saw I was mm -hmm. kinda Instagram looking through your Instagram and the way you capture details in some of these models is it's quite amazing, man. I just gotta give you props and, and it's 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 pretty cool. I mean I yeah, I, I enjoyed the label the level of craftsmanship and detail that you're able to capture. Thank you so much, Eddie. It's been a real journey just from starting with my very first kit that I just, you know, took out of the box and was just tearing the pieces out of the runners That's and then evolved right to now. using a toenail <laughs> clipper. Yep, yeah. yeah, we all start right from there with our very first one. And then just getting to the level of, you know, customizing little parts and then going to like scribing in detail lines, getting into airbrushing. And even now I still try new techniques like using epoxy putty for sculpting different shapes. Yeah, making making it your own, making it look more unique. Mm -hmm. And speaking exactly. of painting, like, what do you find it easier to do? Like, is it priming them while they're still on the runners? I see a lot of people like suggest priming stuff while they're still on the runners or weathering it while it's still together. Or would you do you like putting them on clips and separate or assembling it first? Or what 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 angles do you take at that? Yeah, that's a great question. You'll see a lot of people try a lot of different things, and all of them, you know, work. Some will cause yeah. or require more labor than others, but all of them do require work at the end of the day. For me, I like to fully assemble a kit just like the way you're doing right now, yeah. where you can actually see it in its form, what it looks like out the box, and you can see that looks great, that needs fixing, that needs replacing, this is gonna need touch up in some way once you paint. And once you kind of get your idea, your scheme, and your plan ahead of you, that's when um, you can finally do your work on it, customize it, and then when I'm ready to paint it, I'll tear it down, put them on clips like you said, and then just going through the painting process, just priming, putting on appreciating or layers, and just going on from there until eventually you have a finished product. Can I ask you about your painting process a little bit? Like, um, I guess kind of what paints do you use? And one of the techniques we learned from a model painter when we were in college, and we didn't dive into this nearly as deep as you guys do customizing mm -hmm. and stuff. But one of the things they kind of showed us was like, you prime with the idea that you have these under shadows and stuff. So maybe if you're, you're doing two layer prime, you'll prime the black and you'll prime a lighter color over it and let those dark underhangs stay dark so that you get almost this, it's almost, you know, subliminal, but it is kind of an undertone technique that you can use for that natural shadow and stuff. Do you use any yeah. techniques like that? 
Yeah, we do. It's actually something called pre-shading where that's exactly what we do. So we put on our What's gray it primer. Uh, it's called pre-shading. Okay. It's actually pre something I don't... Okay. Mm -hmm, exactly. I personally, I don't do it too often just because I never really had the best touch for it. But there are a few other things I do that are similar. So for example, there's a kit I did where this one really good model builder from Japan, his name's Max Watanabe. He has a style where he'll prime his entire kit in black and then he'll just go either by hand or with an airbrush just splotching on primary colors in green just all over it. So it's pretty much just this rainbowed mess and then he sprays his base coat on where it lets those colors seep in underneath to show that different shading, show the different texturing just within the colors itself. Oh wow, that's interesting. So actual color underneath. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. Perfect. So it's the same color and then he applies the, the base coat, but then you have that one level of, uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's cool. That's and it's cool. one of those things where you have to have a really light touch when doing it because one habit that even I get in is even when I appreciate, I'll spray on way too much paint over, over. and it exactly. all just looks it's, that it's color. Exactly. Uh -huh. And that's yeah. why for us, we like to use airbrushes where for us, we can control the PSI of it and we can control just yeah. how much paint goes on with the needle. So having an airbrush with a proper needle size is always really handy because you can just have that right touch of how much air and how much paint you want to let out to where you can do that, whether it's fine lines or just having a very mist coat. And, and is, you kind of did that with the lowrider bandito, right? Sorry, Johnny. Oh no, I was gonna ask like, does that work as well for like weathering techniques? I see like a lot of weather people are using like, I mean, it's almost just like a fine liquid and they're applying it quite often with like a Q-tip or something like that, but is that something you could also use an airbrush with if you know if your technique was good enough or with an airbrush it's a little bit tough um there is actually something where how we talked about pre-shading you can basically do it in the opposite direction where you're spraying a darker color on top to get those little bit of shades and that's called highlighting because you're bringing out certain areas and i know with um if you look at my instagram this little kit called toma 2 it's like this little almost looks like r2d2 but Kind of a different take on it you'll see little bits of dark green over the light green that i actually did after i sprayed everything where it kind of gives it that pre-shading look but i did after the fact mm -hmm. and that gives a little sense of weathering or at least a little sense of kind of color modulation which also helps give it depth yeah. but um generally for weathering like i think what you're talking about is something called filtering where you are using a fine liquid just to change the tone of the color Usually I prefer to do that by hand, but when you spray it on an airbrush, typically you start getting things pulling up a little bit too fast. Mm -hmm. And then generally you're cleaning it off too, so just spray it all and then have kind of control over it. It's a little bit trickier, though, you know, it never hurts to try it. That totally makes sense. And I, you know, that's, that's that really cool, like what I really have like grown such an appreciation for the Gundam Collector. It truly is. Because, you know, I consider that myself. And there's a lot of people in the designer toy scene that are artists and collectors and they trade their toys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it's really cool to see that with the Gundam scene and the 112 scene. Because a lot of you guys are very masculine men. And you guys really do appreciate <laughs> the art and the element towards it. And it's not easy to do. I mean, can we see one of your first pieces that you ever made? Because I know you still have your first piece, don't you? <sighs> I remember I wanted to bring home my first piece and I was actually visiting my family the other day with holidays and I know exactly where the kid is but yeah I remember just looking at it it was so just beat up but uh I can bring it over with me right here okay 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 I can show you an early painted model I did uh back yeah, when I first started getting like into airbrushing yeah, because it's not, people need to realize like how much work it is. I mean, like uh, Kelly and Eddie have their degree in design or toy, in toy, toy design. So, you know, this is a really hard thing to do. And, you know, I give someone props who just really wants to do it for the hobby and the passion because they really enjoy building something. What do you, mm -hmm. you know, so show off his first model and kind of explain like, what do you really get off building something and putting all this work into it? Because it's a lot of hours. What would you say also is the most average hour that you put into one build. I remember we were discussing this one time. As far as hours go, for if I was doing a full paint job, full weathering, it could be 40 plus hours, almost a week's yep. straight work if it was your nine to five job. It's yep. certainly a lot, and that's 
Not even counting time of paint drying, curing, that's actually applying the paint, having your fingers on the model. But also, so here's one of my first painted builds. This is one I did back in 2021, because I remember COVID was lining up. And this was a really fun kit because it was basically based directly off of another artist who I saw, who I thought that just looked amazing. And I wanted to see if I could replicate the same style and the same uh, paint job, color scheme, and just little other details he added onto it. Absolutely beautiful, guys. So Kelly and Eddie, yeah, it's like, really nice. Tell, tell, Thank tell, you. It's pretty like for it's, it's hard to see obviously because the quality is not the perfect but you can tell <laughs> that even in the beginning phases you know you probably had to take your time because when you so pe for people who don't know like the difference between airbrush and like doing it by hand when you do it by hand like if you do the stroke too heavy it's really streaky it don't look mm -hmm. pretty so, yeah you know, or if the paint starts to dry you start pulling paint away yes. yeah that's so, issues yes a lot of issues with paintbrush that that one must master you know but I will give you all the props to that, man. Well, oh, thank you so much. And that's why for me, it's funny. I actually do the opposite where when I see lots of hand painters, because especially in other uh, other sci-fi modelers, they will hand paint everything. So every little bit of detail that you see, both in the detail painting, the weathering, and just the color application itself is all done with one hand and one paintbrush. And that's hard to do. Lord knows I couldn't do it when I saw some of my early, early paint jobs. Uh, back when I was a kid in college, oh, was what, primer, what primer was. Yeah, I knew what primer was. And Kelly, I mean, I'm sure you really can relate to this because you just made that chopper, right? And that chopper took yeah. about, it took roughly a, a really average at the same time. So yeah, it was just about about, 80 hours probably. Yeah, because you but I, bolted it. Yeah, I, I, I designed it, engineered it, and that was probably 40, 40 hours by itself. And then, yeah, the painting and all that stuff afterwards, uh, a lot of time, for sure. Yeah, I bet. And then also, so, you know, kind of the non-hands-on time of if you're resin 3D printing it, of it printing as well. Yeah, that's the truth. I mean, it was probably a 14-hour print or something like that, so that's a great that's quality. I was going to say, that's the reason why hurry, I Hurry up and wait. Mm -hmm. and, like and sometimes I, it don't work you know? <laughs> with uh with the gundam scene i've noticed with so many kits the, the crazy amount of engineering that goes into these i mean it's staggering to begin with and then you take the level of finish work that you, you know that you're putting into because quite often some of these pieces are not seen unless you were to open a vent or the the mm -hmm. piece of art off you know, but people are taking the time to, to paint these under, you know, the ex, the inner skeleton of it as well. So uh -huh. there yep. to do that, that, you know, that you found are helpful to you. Do you want to like assemble that, that inner framework first to kind of spec out how you would want, you know, because so often people have, they've painted the joints, uh, the piston work, you know, all of, you know, mm -hmm. all the hype that goes into these kits. So much work. Very oh, yeah. Cool. It's staggering. Thanks. And you know, that's for me, I'm pretty selective of when I paint an inner frame, uh, how much of it can I let be exposed to show some of that detail. And sometimes when you put all that armor on, all that cool detail is covered. It's such a bummer. It's such a waste of potential. But what, what a lot of artists will do is they'll do something called an open hatch where, for example, it's just like when you see lots of car models, they'll have the hood open. So you can see that whole engine cavity, all the amazing detail, all that, all of those little minute colors you added. And you can only see that if you just pop the hood. Yeah. And with lots of Gunpla artists, they'll do the same thing where they'll have, they'll make it where it looks like armor parts are being lifted off or something I like to do too, is I like to cut out holes so you can look through the armor. Mm -hmm. Just like the way you see, for example, like a radiator guard is made of mesh. It's kind of the same thing. And yes. so what I'll do is I'll try and make some detail be more visible around there. So if you're looking closely at it, um, or even angle it where you can see underneath. So I had one kit where it was basically had thrusters underneath that didn't have legs. So what I ended up doing was um, just posing in a way where you could look underneath it, where you could kind of look under the skirt or under the hood and just see all the different colors and um, details that they had available. Wow, see, and that's amazing because, you know, even like with the designer toy scene, like sometimes what happens is, and it's a very small thing, but I, I always think about it when I do see it with like newer 
uh, designer toy uh, artists is they will not paint the bottom of the toy. <laughs> and it's a it's a very small detail, right? Like, oh, who cares? I'm not painting the bottom. But it's something I think I'm like, I'm like, oh, look at this toy. Look at this. They didn't paint the bottom. That's, that's yeah. the first. That's, that's, that's the first. It's like, oh. It's the same thing with sculpture. You know, you pick something up and you look at the feet and it's like, oh, there's still creases and it's not done. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to see, like, again, you started as, this is a hobby for you, right? Like, it's a hobby mm -hmm. it's good for you. We were talking about that. You really love seeing what you can create. And you've gotten really creative. Like, it blows my mind for people who don't sculpt. Right, like you're you're taking already pre-made pieces and trying to make them into something different, and then also like rebuilding a totally different Gundam that almost is like a, a junkyard Gundam in a sense. Yeah, and I think it's it's really cool. A, Fra a Frankenstein Gundam. A Frankenstein exactly, Gundam. exactly. It, that's really cool because again, it's not like it's not an it's so cool to see someone who is a collector become an artist because now I really do consider you as, as an artist. So let's talk about the competition. How did you transition from doing this as a hobby, really loving it, you're doing great with the photos, your Instagram's doing pretty decent, and then you go to a competition. How did you get to that transition? So for me growing up, I've always been a really competitive person, both in sport, school, you know, everything, and this hobby was included. So once I started getting into the hobby, I started learning that competitions exist. And then when I saw, you know, what kind of caliber of quality of work was at the competition, it was mind blowing to me. And at this time, I was just a guy that liked to build them together, collect them, now having shelves full of them at my house, just cluttering my bedroom. But um, as I started, that was always a big inspiration for me though. And one thing I liked about competitions is it really helped give me a goal of something to strive for, for a finished product. So if I knew a competition had a certain theme, for example, it would ha allow me to kind of formulate an idea around that theme where it's like, okay, well, they want to do like something from this series. Well, let's try and work with something there. And then that's just where the ideas start to flow. No, I think that's, that's, that's exactly, and like, how, what was your, like, reaction to competition? Because, you know, there, sometimes, like, it's really cool, but of course there's people in the scene that you're like, holy crap, this person makes me not want to be in the scene anymore. Did you run into any experiences like that? Like, where you're like, okay, there's a toxic scene. Because I know that you have a really fantastic Gundam scene that you found in San Diego that you meet mm -hmm. up with. You guys are really, like, actual friends. You know, you guys do things for you, hang out and do fun activities together and stuff yeah. like that, which is so cool. Like, that's my goal with the designer toy scene. Um, especially now I'm in Texas, you know, kind of lonesome out here. It's, I'm trying to build a community. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess the question for that is, how did you find this great community and how do you avoid bad communities in the scene? Yeah, so here in San Diego, California, we have a really awesome local group. In fact, some of my closest friends are in that group where we do local meetups every week, just a build, hang out, we'll play anime. And really, you can do whatever you want. You know, if you want to build Lego, you just want to chill, chit chat, by all means. And we'll do stuff like maybe we'll have like events like for Star Wars Day from May the 4th or Christmas parties, things like that. Just stuff to really bring people into the community, both local and some people will sometimes travel. I love um, that, that rising a lot more in the communities that people yeah. start to uh, start to do do gatherings and get together and the whole customization aspect like you were saying though like being themed around something like it's being seen more along with action figures as well like if mm -hmm. people don't like they I wouldn't say they press companies but they want to see certain figures made or created and people are oh yeah to, like, we do the same thing we yeah. Band yeah. Right. <laughs> And they frank, like I guess in, in a way you guys Frankenstein your own kids, people are starting to Frankenstein and create their own action figures and they get together mm -hmm. and they trade them and they customize them. It hasn't quite come to the level where I've seen like people customizing action figures for like competition level, but having that mm -hmm. idea or that theme in mind, I think that's, that's kind of, that's a good, that's a good, almost essential to the customization aspect of something. Having a goal yeah. or an ultimate, yeah, an ultimate, vision. and it helps inspire a goal as well. Because sometimes, and I'm sure you guys, as artists and toy designers, you get that it happens. I'm sure at least once where you know you run out of ideas or you can't think yeah. of an idea to do. You get kind of that artist block. It sure happens to me. In fact, I recently had that happen myself, where you know I just didn't know what I want to do after finishing my really big kit for the year. It's like. 
well, I'd like to, you know, rest a bit. You know, I had other things going on, but want to get back into it. And I want to go in with a bang. Mm -hmm. But then when I have some competitions coming up, it kind of makes me think, well, I want to do this and there's this theme. I think as artists, we always think we want this open-ended, you know, freedom and blue sky to design. But what really happens is you get that design criteria and that little box you have to work within. And that's when the real ideas start to flow mm -hmm. because you have yes. a, a focus, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree hundred percent, Kelly. I think that once you do put restrictions and I think some people even do this as art challenges for themselves where they're forced to draw with just pencil, um, or maybe, you know, whatever the case may be a slight type of challenge. Um, artists need inspiration like that. And that's why like yeah. even us you know, joining as a group and, you know, like you said, building a community, it, it even like on a side note, when I have a community that I'm part of, it's just like going to a convention, right? It's like having your own private convention where you mm -hmm. don't have to deal with lines, you don't have to deal with all that crap. And you guys kind of have your own little competitions in there yourselves, right? Like your own little things mm -hmm. and there, things like that, where it's, it's more friendly and showing off and like, you know, that's that's cool too for people who are a little more intimidated to go in those bigger competitions. Cause it can be intimidating. Like if you're not a, if you don't have stage oh, presence. Like, absolutely. Like I have, yeah, right? Like I have stage presence, so I'm really used to that. But if you are not a stage person, like you could mm -hmm. be someone who's really good at your stuff, but like you you, don't, you can't go on stage and do that. No, no way, no how. Oh, absolutely. And some people, it's like, that's their page. You know, like for me, I put my face on my page a lot. So, you know, you see me, but you also see a lot of my work. And same with yeah. lots of video content creators as well. And not everyone likes it, and that's okay. You know, some people yeah. love it just for the product they put out or the art. It's like, yeah. for example, like, you know, you could, I could name a bunch of really famous paintings and I probably won't be able to think of the face of it. I could just think yeah. of the amazing work they put out. Yeah. But you I know think what? you're right. I think both is okay. And like Gabriella yeah. has kind of pointed out to me through this process, like we just did the podcast because we kind of felt like we had to. But now, like, kind of understanding it from different perspectives, it's like, oh, you really want to see the face and the personality of the character that's making these things that yes. you're so into. And that only adds to the, to the, I guess, you collectability in some, some ways that you know the artist. I mean, I fell in love with Todd McFarlane when I, you know, I was growing up and, and other artists. And it's like you know you want to know more about them you want to mm -hmm. you want to find everything out about them That's that you exactly. can when you're really into it yeah. and stuff and yeah it's a thing as a collector especially... you want to know it's like little little secret information like johnny who's just you know like a really just true collector like you and kelly like you guys know artists right like you guys actually know some big time artists you guys you know done work at mattel and crazy stuff like that but let's talk about johnny like he is talking to a bunch of big artists who love him just because he's a genuine soul and he buys their toys and Johnny will tell them why he buys them and it makes them want to give him more toys because they like nice. him so because he's a genuine sweetheart. So Johnny That's awesome. how do you have with that. Um well I don't know. I I don't know how it happens or why it happens. I just I, no, Johnny has stupid luck. Don't even let him he's being very humble right now. Like artists sure. want to give him the well, he's sure. I, I'm old enough now that I, I've seen enough things and there's enough stuff stored somewhere in the archive. Don't age us, Johnny. Don't age us. <laughs> this is public. Who was president? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, the ability, like, you know, and that's what's really cool about Gundam is, like, you know, I hadn't realized Gundam was, like, 1979, for goodness mm -hmm. sakes. It, oh, yeah. Right? So ahead of its time. That it yeah, it was kind of Robotech, you know, because I started out with Robotech. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, we couldn't I, get Robotech. Mecca. And <laughs> where the, the scene has gone to, like, you know, where I was cool with, like, having a little cool Transformer thing or whatever, you know, but they were all the same. <laughs> Nobody took the time to customize something. <laughs> the way yep. that, and what's cool with, like, Kelly's stuff is, like, you know, the customization that's going in, the, the, the amount of work that's being put in the... the the engineering, for goodness mm -hmm. sake, the y'all's, you know, the Diablo yeah, it's going to like Gunpla. And then it's cool that we've got this, it goes all the way back to 78 prior to like, I know there's at least a couple of people here that weren't born in 78. <laughs> okay, it's rude. And okay. oh, it's a generation, <laughs> you know, it's still active today. 
And then not only is it like what you're doing, Daniel, you know, like the mm -hmm. cool, crazy customization of the, the, the model itself, but then like you get folks that are working these in like insane dioramas. I mean, oh, yeah. staggering work where they're, they're filming them with high resolution cameras. And it's essentially like, you would look at it and you would die. That's a damn Marvel movie. How the hell did you pull that off? I know it's yeah. just movie prop level of quality. Yeah. It's insane. And really, again, I preach this. The United States is way behind Asia. We are so yeah. behind Asia. It's when it's, it comes to toy, when it comes to toys, I have to agree. Oh, yes. I think Our we're entertainment them. is here to change all that. I know I, you are. Kelly. I know yes. Shameless plug. Yes, thanks. Like, like, Kelly and Eddie are going to tear that seat up when it comes to that. And yeah. I really do believe that. Especially you guys getting in the designer toy world and getting this art, the artist approach towards things. Uh, getting in the designer toy world. But it's like, again, uh, Gun that's why I want to talk to the Gundam, uh, you know, to Gundam builders like Earth Bear, shout out to Earth Bear and Junkla and Zach and mm -hmm. like, you know, all you guys have been so wonderful. All the homies. Yeah, like New that's all of those. Yeah, really I put great. Daniel follows them. Oh yeah. Yeah, Newgate. Uh, oh my goodness. Can you talk a little bit about some of what your imagination has done as you worked on some of these things? You must allow yourself to mm -hmm. go there a little bit and say, "Oh, I would do this with this kind of thing," or what? What would it look like if you had, you know, like I said, complete creative control? So for me, what my goal is always with my personal style is if this thing could be on my driveway, one-to-one -one scale, could it exist? Or would it kind of make sense for it to exist? And I guess for me, that's why I like the real robot version of genre, which is why I like Gundam a lot, because there's a lot of Gundam series that are like that, where they're pretty much just tanks with legs at this point. Yeah. Um, right. and, and they're just no BS about it. And that's what I really like in my style. So I like to add lots of machinery details the best I can. Well, conduits, piping. Like gears and hydraulics. I, I love yeah, drawing exactly. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Exactly. My, my, yeah. One, of my, one of Eddie and I's um, uh, three dimensional teachers called it um, gear wallpaper. Mm hmm. <laughs> Doesn't really. Although, I think what you're saying is you would like to see it work. And that's how I kind of like to imagine it when I'm drawing it is like, oh, exactly. Yeah, if, if I'm staring at this, I want to look at it and see if it actually operates the thing. Yeah, exactly. Like for me, I love having hydraulic pistons on. It's just a style yeah. I like. It's a gimmick I like on lots I of kits. I can't stop drawing hydraulic pistons. <laughs> They're just so easy and so cool. But the thing is, it needs to make sense. So for example, like, yeah. you know, on a Gundam, you're not going to see a hydraulic on its cheek just there. You can't just, you know, it would squish have to a bunch of detail in your mouth and spit yeah. it out. It's got to be tastefully placed in an area where yeah. it would make sense that it needs some kind of cushioning like that. Or putting like crash bars somewhere, or putting electrical conduits somewhere. That's where... story. That kind of attention yeah, exactly. to detail is story. And that includes the weathering as well. You know, yeah. where do I want my weathering to make sense? Where do I want to be lighter, heavier? Where do I want it to look like things are impacting, bumping it, or where Build it's up around the joints? Dirt? Yeah, that's where what I've seen I... a lot of a lot of the gunplay going. Like when they actually set them in dioramas and they create scenes. Like I've seen very very cool ones where it's like they take a model kit. And they make it look like it's it's been sitting in the jungle for a thousand mm -hmm. years and it's deteriorating and it's overgrown yeah. vegetation. Exactly. I I've mean, seen some guys do that. Things like that. So you buy funny. a model okay. kit for like 12 to 20 bucks. Somebody's going to pay easily a hundred bucks for it. I mean, it, it, um, it's a, you know what I'm saying? It's a quick it's flip that you can make, but it's like, it's art that you can sell for even more. Like, yeah, like you're saying, like, and it's, it creates story. I mean, it, it, who've got individual missiles coming out of like pods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just it, you know, yeah, they're just sitting there, and they then you hit yeah. the flick switch, and then the lights go on. Oh, and it's like, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. people are taking the all the con things. that they use for yeah. smoke and everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and that and that's what's Lighting. cool. I remember Gabby, we were talking about this. Is the cool thing about toy collecting, whether it's you know figures, um, car models, gunpla, is that you're not just looking at one thing at one angle. You're looking at it from all angles, above, below, to the side, where you get to see every piece of that, just like you were to see, like, you know, a physical model when you're painting. You're looking at it at all angles to get every contour. And I think yeah. that's one thing I love with Gunpla is you're making, you're creating, you're breathing life into an inanimate object. Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. And like, that's why like people who like toys, and I've, I've really broken down people who like, who don't realize they're a little, they're, they like art. They're like, I just <laughs> like toys, you know, I just like toys is my thing, you know, I like the hype, da, da, da. And I'm like, but you like art. You're an artist, you're kind of sensitive. They're like, what? No, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, oh, man, I don't do that. No, I build, build robots. And I'm like, yes. dude. <laughs> robots. <laughs> but it's it, an art. You know, it, it goes back to the time of like knights and kings. You know, these are mm -hmm. giant mechanized suits of armor for going out and doing battle on the, you know, on the, on the battlefield, you know? There is mm -hmm. like a crazy long history looking back at like, you know, the samurai and how that ties yes. in with them. We always lot. talk about this, Johnny. We always oh, talk that's about how a lot of Gundam design is designed. Like the V-fin you see on the head, that's made from samurai helmets that would have a yep. similar V design or their family clan crest, things like that. And that's yep. where, yep, exactly. See, Eddie has it right there. And that's where yep. Gundam took a lot of their designs from. And then a lot of, you know, kind of thematic stuff due to World War II and a lot of things like that. That's, Plus, interesting. Well, that's interesting. How can it not be cool if it's a giant mechanized robot? Right, just, exactly. Yeah. How can you not like that? Yeah, and I think it really could be an interior design element. And that's what designer toys are. So it's like, you know, it's not a crazy price point to make a toy. If you buy a toy for, you know, like I said, we go back to Eddie and uh, Eddie and Kelly with the Odd Frog and One Twelve Chop Chop Shop. That car is one hundred eighty nine dollars. You could sell that car for five hundred dollars easy. We already have an art gallery who is reaching out to us to customize the car, and they want to sell it in their art gallery. So it's like oh, that's it's cool. an unlimited. It's an unlimited thing when you're able to customize something, and people are like. You don't have to do it because you want to sell it, but do it because you know people are going to want to buy it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm fine to one of my things I've customized, and I'll keep it for myself. But if someone's offering, like, wants to buy it and says, hey, I'll give you $500 for it, and I put in $200 and maybe a lot of hours or something, I'm like, hmm. That's just the free price? market, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I never want to. Um... There. That's what my wife always tells me. The market will bear. The market will bear. The market dictates the price. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. She's absolutely right. And uh, God, don't get me started about this. <laughs> I could go off for days. Hey, oh, I, yeah. wanted um, to be, I wanted to be the accountant for Odd Frog, so. And it's a good It really is. But I mean, it's good for the artists if they get, you know, that those kind of prices. Yeah, at some point, you know, maybe somebody who doesn't have that kind of liquidity may be priced out of it. But there's nothing to say at that point you couldn't build your own, like you've talked about. You know, there's so many guys in the gun plus scene that seem ready, willing, and able to mm -hmm. provide help to people who are trying to just break in to, you mm -hmm. know, doing. You What's know? interesting to me is like what Eddie and I are trying to do is build in customization so that the Option. consumer is the one that gets to create the piece, right? And mm -hmm. it seems like to me, um, Daniel, that there's a lot of opportunity in, uh, let's just say kits. Say we were to design a, gu a, a Gundam, an American one or whatever, mm -hmm. and cool. you, could, you could easily take the template that Eddie's created for switching out the kits into a Gundam. I, I don't know, is there points of articulation on these? Are they mostly statues, Daniel? How does it work? So they're very articulated. So for example, I have this kit right up here. So this is uncustomized, unpainted, just snap. But I mean, you can fully oh. bend the legs. You can see Dang, all the armor parts that's moving double, around. That's double jointed knees. That's no, nice. I know. Kelly, and double jointed on, elbows. I'll send you Michael Savage, or Adam Savage. I, really like double oh, elbows. I, I know that other one you're talking about too. Oh, though. the Perfect Raid Unleashed. That's yeah. such a cool kit. RX-78 Perfect Grade, and he he's... said Michael Savage. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard that name in a long time. I haven't either. Yeah, he's... Is he still even on the air? No, he retired. Oh, okay. But yes, Adam Savage, watching him build that... He's I love got... that we all know who this is, though. That's hilarious. Two other people You're sitting definitely there... Definitely from Texas. And <laughs> watch his expressions as he's seeing how the joints that were already pre-assembled were molded together mm -hmm. when or when yep, they and then it builds around it too. Yeah. Wow. 
Oh, it's insane. I'll send Kelly the video of it. Watching him do that build is just, it's a huge eye opener. Oh, that's fantastic. Awesome. That kid's huge. I built, I built that kid. It's so much fun. And all the opening parts on it, it just looks amazing. And you can tell there's a wow. lot of artistic liberty put on that compared to the, you know, the original Gundam that it's based off of. You know, it's just a completely that's, modern take. There's just something me. so timeless about the RX-78. Yeah. It just really is. It's just something timeless. That's the, is that the giant one in Japan? Yes. I know that's the, the, I, the, 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 the I like the unicorn one. The unicorn one the I like. Unicorn, well, with the little sh Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Open up. It's yeah. pretty rad. And I think, I think that's cool with the original cool. Gundam was its design was so simple when it was first introduced into the world that it what became an open Gundam? canvas. The so the original ones. Yep. Yep, Johnny got, nailed it right there. The what RX-78 it? It? two, RX-78 uh, B, I believe was was that so, the first. It's so interesting yeah. to me this conversation actually now that I think about it because is it there's a new game out that's like um uh babe what's what's the game you like to play that's super hard it's like a Souls game. Uh, Dark Souls. Uh, Dark, no, no, no. Uh, the new the new one. Elden Ring. Elden Ring. So like, there's a. It's see, my my friend George uh, loved Elden Ring and also is now playing this new Gundam video game. That's like, oh, the mechanics. He's like, you don't even understand. It, it's so good. God, I wish I could think of it. Let me, let me text him. Talking about that Starlight Armor game? Core. Oh yeah, Armor Core. I heard that game. Like they actually take weight into it's account Armor Core. and different things. Yes. Like, it's very, oh, wow. It's Physics. very real world. Yeah. Wow. That's rad. Yeah. Like Gabriella, we might have to check it out because it, I think from so. everything I've heard, it is the like I don't know about Gundam, but it is Gundam. Yeah. From what I yeah, understand. That's cool. that's the really game cool. mechanics are amazing. You know, and it's actually we have to thank Gundam, because if it wasn't for Gundam, I don't know which one I'm pretty sure Gundam came first, but for thanks to Gundam, then Transformers came out. And I think Transformers is revolutionary. I watched how it's made with Transformers because those toys to to literally transform such a pre for a cheap price point that they made it for mm -hmm. it was absolutely genius during the time. It seems to be durable for a little kid to Compared be mangling. To I couldn't oh. afford Transformers when I was a kid. Like we lived out in the desert in the middle of nowhere, so we had to drive 45 minutes to get toys. And by the time I got there, it'd be like, hmm, four GI Joes or one Transformer. You know, I had oh, to. Good. I had to go with my loyalty, but yeah. Uh, that, I, that, I couldn't afford Transformers back in the day. Johnny, you remember. Were they I got GoBots. Oh yeah, Leader One. Go, that's right, Leader One, GoBots, the cheap knockoff. <laughs> they made a I can afford GoBots. Yes. Transformers, that's an, is that an American company? I can't remember. No. no. Mm -mm. Who's that one by? That was Bandai as well. Yeah, was Bandai it? back that's in Bandai, the year launch. Oh, Bandai just kind of kill, Bandai yeah. kills it. I can't mess with Bandai is like an insanely historical freaking company. People have yeah. no mm -hmm. over here. They have Bandai a studio about 45 minutes from here. There's Bandai has their hands in everything. There's things that Bandai owns that you don't even know. Like, it's insane. That's, <laughs> like that's why they branched out so much too into so many different uh, franchises for model kits. So it kind yeah. of sucks for Gundam. So for us, we don't get a whole lot of Master Grades now, but. You know, on oh, the yeah. other hand, they do all these other things. That's cool. Yeah, you know, and that's, it's, it's, that's, that's why it's really cool. Cause you we were talking about like the knockoffs and things like that. And like your opinion mm -hmm. on knockoffs, because you know, there has been a little bit where, you know, Bandai, you know, things like that with Gundam and stuff, they have a lot of different people to make happy and things with their being a big corporation. So I asked you what your opinion was on bootlegs with Gundam, because some people hate bootlegs. like. <laughs> with designer toys, <laughs> whoa, whoa, with designer toys, especially with GI Joes, I see a gazillion bootlegs. I can't even count to you. I, I mean, mm -hmm. every bootleg you possibly can think of. Same with like uh, Star Wars toys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, and I like some of them when they're actually like just customizing the outfit and making it like a custom character. I think that's really fun. Some people though, like you know, they they'll try to sell them and say they're original toy. When there was no actual change of sculpture whatsoever towards it. Um, so, yeah. what is your opinion with bootleg Gundams? Do you think that they are really just like copying the toy, or do you think that they do a little bit of different elements where they're still having design, just really Great being question. heavily inspired by Gundam? 
Yeah, so I I actually kind of wrote a little write up on this because it's definitely a conversation you could talk about forever about it. But the way I see it is every art piece is an inspiration that that piece itself was inspired by someone else who was inspired by someone else. And it's been like that yes. since the first caveman put the first paint on a rock. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie yeah. what did the four horsemen tell you about us getting ripped off in our design? It's the best form mm. of flattery. Yep, exactly. And that's actually <laughs> what I wrote is that, you know, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So, yeah. you know, like circling back to this kid I did, this was pretty much a one, like a one-to-one -one copy almost of someone else's work that I just wanted to challenge myself to create. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's, you know, it's a good thing to acknowledge that artist and to show their respect by saying, hey, so, you know, this guy on Instagram, I basically made a copy of his because I really love his work. I think that's where, you know, that yeah. imitation is the most sincere flattery, you know, crediting them, acknowledge them, and, you know, yeah, acknowledge the respect that you have. The pursuit yeah. of what you tried to do is showing him that you understand the level of execution he had to go through to present that piece. Yeah, exactly. I, think, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. In the designer toy world, people get heavily inspired with colorways and characters they like. Like, I see it with Spider-Man, Pikachu. You name it. I can think of now mm -hmm. people are even getting a little too close because they're wearing the same, the costumes of other people's characters and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And that's considered inspired. It's not them really taking the character because you have to truly not change the sculpture so much. Like it's the sculpture changing the pose. Like that's not inspired. That's just copying at the end of the day. Um, but you know, I do think there's a classy way to do it because I'm heavily inspired. We're all heavily inspired. There's really no mm -hmm. such thing as true uh, originality in this kind of day and age, right? So it's like being ha having the balls to be like, this is what inspired me. It makes me connect to it more. To be like, oh, this is what inspired them. That would inspired me too to make this. Well, yes, I think exactly. what Eddie's created is literally what you're talking about. Let's give the toy to the artist and let them do it. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that was his whole Otis. The whole uh, Otis. Modus operandi, you know, is like mm -hmm. let's give the let's empower the customizer <laughs> and the and the photographer. Yeah, exactly. and I think the collector, like this is a very <laughs> sacred thing that a I lot was like, no, let's not. Let's make it shiny and sell a bunch of toys. And Eddie's <laughs> like, no, 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 no. This is about the collector. Mm -hmm. You know what, Eddie? I love that because this is a sacred thing that the collector does, right? Like it's like people are not doing this just because they want to buy toys it's more that it makes them happy you're making a sanctuary in your home and then you're also creating something so that's why like with the build kits and everything i heavily respect it because i would i would be selling those i'd be selling those things for quite a high dollar i'm like you know how much time i'm putting this at just picking it apart <laughs> like the process like he was telling me the steps like sometimes it's really like you have to be like a little military sergeant, like, okay, t today I'm breaking it all apart. Okay, mm -hmm. then today I'm climbing all these pieces. And then today, and then, you know, it's, it's today, a Today I'm not letting Kelly hold it at all. <laughs> that It'll would break. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly has, has big giant man hands that I'm are a like- little a little clumsy. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of clumsy. I'm not the most uh, graceful thing. But you know, it's 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 a really cool scene, dude. And like, you know, I love that you're so into this scene, but you still have a really great balance with, with regular life and stuff. I mean, like you tell me that your wife, she has her own separate hobby, right? She loves oh, plants. Yeah. I'm sorry, that's interesting, Gabrielle. And I know you wanted to get into this and- uh, And then we'll, got... and then we'll, and then we'll yeah. let them get going. I know we're yeah. hitting our No, 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 heart. please, please go ahead. Um, but you know, I really, wanna, I really wanna touch base on that because it just shows such a healthy lifestyle. Johnny's back. Hello, Johnny. <laughs> We're talking about lifestyle and how to have a healthy lifestyle while being collector. Because at the end of the day, we're all in relationships here, you know, and it, there is a balance, right? Owning a business, having a hobby, being an artist, and being in a relationship, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really not easy, but you guys really do find a way to maintain it and still spend quality time while you're doing your guys' hobby. So kind of explain what's up my guys i just wanted to give you a little tidbit about this video this video is really difficult to play with and edit because it's a really big file and we saved it at the highest quality and for some reason it just cut off the last 20 minutes it was really great information and man i really appreciate daniel for being so patient with this video like this video was supposed to be posted like three weeks ago but i had to redo it over and over again so thank you again daniel for being so patient with this and allowing the edits like there is some edits some things that cut out here 
here and there, which I apologize, but it had to because this video was just being so complicated. It was a very complicated video, but here it is. I hope you guys enjoyed it and there will be more of us joining together this TKO vibe, which is supposed to be Toxin, Kilikawaii, and Odd Frog. So I'm really looking forward to all this. Thank you guys again for watching the video.